So imagine a young Japanese American boy growing up in Indiana in the early 1970s, the only Asian kid in school. That kid needed a celebrity role model. But which Asian role model from TV could I choose? <laughs> you see where I'm going with this? Uh, you know, I could have uh, chosen Detective Nick Yamana on Barney Miller. Now, for those of you who are young, uh, that probably sounds like an exciting cop show. Um, <laughs> Jack Sue's character mainly was famous for making lousy coffee. Okay, so that was his specialty on the show, but quite an amazing actor. Uh, there was also assistant coroner Sam Fujiyama, who was Jack Klugman's faithful sidekick on Quincy. But uh, for a kid, that line of work didn't really interest me at all. I needed something different. I needed a Starfleet officer. I needed a swashbuckling swordsman, a man with the voice of a god. Mr. Sulu from Star Trek was there for me when others weren't. <laughs> Later, of course, to be Captain Hikado Sulu of the USS Excelsior. We can't forget about that. So that, that was my guy. What can we tell you about George Takei? Even if we could talk uh, him and Brad into staying in Portland for another few days, we wouldn't have enough time to share with you everything he's done in his illustrious career. His accomplishments go much further than his Star Trek fame. In addition to his impressive acting career, George has lent his passion and time to politics and civic affairs issues. A longtime member of JACL, George educates the public on the importance of human rights from the point of view of a former child prisoner of American concentration camps during World War II. I never thought I'd get to meet my childhood hero, but here we are. Uh, before I introduce him to you, I want to say something that I've always wanted to say for years. Captain Sulu, you have the calm. Jeff, thank you for that heroic introduction. Uh, I might also add, I was the best helmsman in the galaxy. <laughs> Thus shattering the uh, stereotype about Asian drivers. <laughs> thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for that wonderful welcome. And I want to thank uh, you, Jeff, and the uh, Japanese American Citizens League, and the um, Oregon Nikkei Endowment for organizing this and the great work that you put into observing Day of Remembrance. It's um, a very special experience for me. It is a merging and blending of so many different groups. And I know that in this group, we have more than just uh, Japanese Americans and lesbian and gay and bisexual and transgender people. We have another unique group called Trekkies. <laughs> so this is a very special experience for me. As we've heard uh, many times already this afternoon, exactly 69 years from yesterday, February 19th, in 1942, President Franklin D. Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, which set in motion the incarceration of over 127 innocent American citizens and permanent residents. Pearl Harbor was bombed, and overnight, Japanese Americans were looked at with fear and suspicion and hatreds, hatred simply because we happened to look like the people who bombed Pearl Harbor. All across, or up and down the West Coast, Japanese Americans were summarily rounded up and imprisoned in 10 internment camps in some of the most hellish places in this country. So we were incarcerated in these uh, places. Uh, there were two in the blazing hot desert of Arizona. Can you imagine the summers there? There were two camps in uh, the southeastern swamps, the fetid, sultry swamps of Arkansas. The high plains, the windswept, cold high plains of Idaho, Wy uh, uh, Wyoming, Utah, and Colorado had internment camps. And two of the most desolate places in California had these 
internment camps, barbed wire concentration camps, really. I was almost five years old at that time. My father had told me that we were going on a long vacation to a country, in, uh, to the country, and it was far, far away. And I'll, I'll never f forget that one particular day when I was standing in the living room, looking out the living room window, when I saw two soldiers come marching up our driveway, stomping up onto our porch, and banged on, on our front door to order our family out. My parents had packed very quickly the night before, and we were ready. We picked up our luggage, and we stepped out. I remember seeing tears welling up in my mother's eyes. We were taken from there to what, what we later learned was an assembly center, a nearby racetrack. Actually, I was disappointed. It wasn't far, far away. It was only about a half an hour away from our home. We were led to the horse tables. And from our two-bedroom home, we, all five of us, the three kids, I was the oldest, my brother was a year younger, and my baby sister was an infant. We were forced to stay in this narrow horse stall. For me, it was kind of fun. We got to sleep where the horses sleep. I could even smell them. But I can't imagine how degraded how humiliated my parents must have felt taking their three young children into that smelly, narrow horse stall. They had lost their business, a, a dry cleaning business. They lost our home. They lost our freedom. Our bank account was frozen. It was a devastating loss. Farmers lost their farms. They lost their crop, their equipment. Shopkeepers lost their business, the shop, the stock. And all our bank accounts were frozen. It was a catastrophic event for Japanese Americans. And on February 19th, we remember the pain and the anguish and the loss of that day with what we call the Day of Remembrance. We commemorate that day, but more importantly, we commemorate the importance of our civil liberties. That's a precious treasure, and one doesn't appreciate its value until it's lost. And it can be lost very easily. One stroke of the pen of a powerful man, one man, can erase our civil liberties. So we commemorate the value of our civil liberties, but we also understand how fragile it can be. Throughout the history of our country, we have a rather checkered history with our civil liberties. Our, the ideals of this country were eloquently articulated by our founding fathers, and it's been enshrined in our Constitution. Yet, these wise men kept other human beings as slaves. They had no civil liberties to begin with. The institutions of, of American society had no role for women in it. They had it taken away, or they were denied it by tradition. There was another class of people, people that were indentured, and their lives were just a notch above the slaves. They had very few civil liberties. And we need to be mindful, certainly of the preciousness of our civil liberty, but also its fragility. The reason we have the civil liberties that we do have today and take so for granted is because of the many heroes throughout history who struggled for it. And one of those heroes 
came from right here in Portland, Oregon. Some of the Japanese Americans here may recognize the name Min Yasui. He was born in Hood River. He was a young attorney, passed the bar exam, and he was practicing law here in Portland when Pearl Harbor was bombed. And even before the signing of Executive Order 9066, the military imposed a curfew on all Japanese Americans here in Portland. Japanese Americans were to be confined to their homes from 7 p.m. to 6 a.m. Min recognized immediately as a young lawyer that this was unconstitutional and it was not right. And so he put on his best, best suit and tie and went downtown after 7 o'clock and walked around the main streets of downtown, daring the authorities to do something about it. By 11 o'clock, he got tired of walking around downtown. <laughs> so he marched into the police station and said, I'm a Japanese American, and I've been walking around downtown. What are you going to do about it? <laughs> and so the police accommodated him. They accommodated him in a jail cell. He was jailed. But Min was a feisty guy. He wasn't going to just take it. He hired another attorney to challenge the curfew. Executive Order 9066 was signed, and his family was taken away. He pursued the curfew all the way to the federal district court where he was found guilty. And so he carried it even further than that. He took it all the way to the Supreme Court of the United States, and he was still found guilty. And he was moved from that jail cell to an internment camp. He was a strong-willed man and a man who had a sense of justice. In 1981, he became the chairman of the JACL's uh, campaign to get redress for Japanese Americans for the internment. And in 1988, President Ronald Reagan signed executive order, uh, uh, signed uh, the uh, Civil Liberties Act of 1988, which formally ap apologized on behalf of the government to the Japanese American community and pledged a redress of $20,000, which was just a token of the uh, loss but a very significant uh, gesture. Min and many others worked on that redress campaign and prevailed. So as fragile as our civil liberties may be, it takes heroes with courage and principle and tenacity to keep America's ideals true and authentic. And throughout history, we have many, many heroes like that. Historic names like Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, for the women's movement, Susan B. Anthony, and in more recent times, Dr. Martin Luther King, with whom I marched and raised my voice in song, and heroes like Cesar Chavez, where I did some readings at those rallies for the farm workers. It is people with principle and the courage to fight for our civil liberties that make our democracy the dynamic democracy it is. I grew up behind those barbed wire fences of those camps, too young to really recognize what they were. I grew up in innocence. I thought the life I lived behind those barbed wire fences was normal. It was grotesquely abnormal. And today, those, thank God those fences are gone. But I still see another kind of fence that keeps another group of Americans confined behind a different kind of barbed wire fence. They are legalistic fences laws with the sharp, hard barbs of prejudice and intolerance and ignorance. 
It's normal for two people who love each other, who care for each other through thick and thin, in sickness or in health, to be able to be married. It's normal for committed couples to share in their property, insurance, and pension benefits. Those of you that are married here know that. It's normal for people who are working and contributing to their employers to be secure and confident that they can continue to work. What is abnormal is that lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender Americans cannot. There are laws of intolerance and stupidity that prevent them from, from living a normal life. Let me take one stupid policy that we have recently gotten rid of called Don't Ask, Don't Tell. We live in a time of extreme threat to our national security. And vital to our na national security is solid, reliable intelligence. We have in our intelligence service officers who are fluent in Arabic, an important language for our national security at this time. But if they are found to be gay or lesbian, they're terminated. How stupid is that? <laughs> our national security is endangered. Homophobia takes precedence over our security. We have people that are on bloody battlefields, the same way that the Nisei soldiers fought on the battlefields of Italy and France and Germany, who are bleeding and dying. But if they're found to be gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender, they're terminated. Is that what America is all about? We finally, only three months ago, last December, have come to our senses. That is a stupid policy. <laughs> and we've rescinded that. Our democracy is a dynamic work in progress. You are change agents by your presence here today. And by having the, me, these meetings and by being informed, we make America a truer, better, more authentic democracy. Thank you very much. Thank you.